there's a, a famous painting. I forgot what it's called, but it's the picture of God holding the lantern. I think it's called the light of the world. And it's a door that doesn't have a knob on the outside. And someone asked the artist, why you, you didn't finish your painting. There's no, do there's no knob on the door. And he said that the door to the human heart has no handle on the outside. You have to be let in from within. So as an educator, in order to reach these children, you have to work for them to unlock that door from the inside and allow you to come in. You're the beacon of light shining on the outside for them in a dwelling of darkness. But they have to make the decision to open that door to allow you in. And once you get in that door, don't get in the house and get the kicking stuff around and saying you need to organize this and do that. Just, just politely sit and listen. Welcome to the Mindset on Resilience podcast, where we're building a more confident, resilient, and mentally strong community. I'm your host, Daniel True Love, and I'm excited to bring to you another episode. Uh, the guest that we have today needs no introduction, but I guess I have to do it. <laughs> he is, uh, what I'll say about him is that he's an amazing man. I met him uh, when I was uh, working at a, at a school and um, doing some work out there, and just the uh, way that we've continued to stay in communication with each other, uh, the work that he's done, not only in the community, um, the work that he's done uh, within his professional ca uh, career has been absolutely amazing. And one thing that I can say about him that I appreciate is that he's somebody that actually cares about people. And so I'm excited to bring to you none other than my guest for today, Mr. David Corker. How you doing, man? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Oh, man, I'm excited. I'm excited. Uh, so... Uh, Tell us a little bit about uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. I know that's probably like a you know question. Here. Tell us about yourself, and it's kind of one of those things like, what do I say? You know, when somebody asks that question, um, but I would love to know a little bit about uh, you know your journey, your your career journey, and um, you know how you got to uh, do the work that you do do. What was your journey to that? Um, I'm the oldest of one. I have a younger sibling. I grew up in Atmore, Alabama. Um, I was a, a athlete my entire life. Um, I hunted a little bit, fished a little bit, but I've always been very uh, focused on academics and football. Um, I knew in high school at an early age I wanted to do psychology because I was always questioning and wondering why I think the way that I think, why people behave the way that they behave. And naturally, I gravitated to psychology. So I went to the University of West Alabama. I went to a school prior to that. It was a private Mennonite school called Tabor College, and I studied psychology there, and I transferred to the University of West Alabama. Um, I got my master, not my master's, but my bachelor's in 2013 in psychology, and literally the day after graduation, I moved to another dorm and started my master's program the very next day and finished that in 2015. Um, literally, when I graduated, I had a job in my hometown in community mental health and I moved back and I started working there. Um, I worked a job prior to that was kind of in the mental health field before I got my master's, but it wasn't truly like psychology and therapy. It was more dealing with uh, mentally uh, disabled people running a group home facility. So, but I ended up working uh, doing psychology for about three years. I was a crisis interventionist. Um, I did a lot of in-home intensive treatment. I started a lot of my days in the hospital, saw a lot of suicidal patients, um, worked well with some people in the school system, and I was brought uh, over to education by an, a, another lady who I, I did some work with some children that were in school and they were impressed with how I worked with them. I was hired as a crisis interventionist, and I was hired to go all over the district and deal with crisis on a certain day. So I might get an email from a principal saying, hey, I need you to be at my school this day or I need you to be at this school this day. So I would start my days out at those schools. And most of the kids that I work with, I already had relationships with the parents, so to speak, if it was something that would trickle down things. So I kind of already knew most of them. I knew most of the people I, I was working with. So it was pretty easy. Um, after that, I met someone who was, who was very significant to me and they brought me over to their department in uh, student services and safety. And that's where I have been since then. So. I, I currently work in student services and safety for a school district. So I would love to uh, talk to you kind of like starting at the very beginning because you said you've always kind of been interested in 
like the why and that kind of like led you to going uh, to psychology. Like, did you always know that you wanted to work with um, like like mental health or like was that always your journey or did you kind of discover that while you were you know getting your education? That's always been something of I was I was a very aware child. Um, even playing sports, like of course, all of us as athletes wanted to go pro. So <laughs> once the reality of that was out of the picture, it was like, okay, well, let's do something with the psychology thing. I, I'm in school. Um, football has provided me the opportunity to be at someone's university for free and get some knowledge. So let's do something with that. And I had a lot of great professors and people that I met along the way who have been very pivotal to me. Um, even so to this point of steer, trying to steer me out of psychology saying you should be in education. And I'm like, no, I'm going to stay with psychology. I got another year here and I'm going to graduate. It's no way I'm going to switch to go to education, but lo and behold, I've, I've, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> got you to education, right? <laughs> uh, that's right. So what is the, you said you, you work, uh, talked about, uh, behavior and as soon as you said that, uh, I've actually had some people that have recommended that I uh, come work with their or even consult with their districts in the behavior because of just some of the work that I've done with, with you know, with some kids. And so but I would love for you to talk about that. What is that like? You know, think about like the, the problems they call you, you know, you think about that when, the, when there's issues, they're not calling you and say, Hey David, uh, you know, I just want to see if you can come over here and eat lunch with me. No, it's like, Hey, we got a fire that needs to be put out. What is, what is it like in working on a day-to-day in, in that type of environment or dealing with those type of challenges? Well, before I go into that, because it's going to give you an outlook into my mindset. So I started working in community mental health, and you treat more paper than you treat people. And there's a very finite path of treatment that you're going to follow. And once you know that, you have a lot of confidence going into most situations. Like it's either going to be A or B and occasionally C. It is a very small choice of options that you can use. So when I got into the educational side, it was a lot easier, but it was a very fin- th- like very fine line you had to walk. Because a lot of times a teacher would tell you something or an administrator would say, hey, I need you to see this kid about this and that. And I'm like, okay, well, is this really imperative to education? Is this something that's causing an issue in the day? And again, working in a small community, most people are gonna know about some of the after hour things that go on. And you're reporting that to me, wanting me to deal with it. And I'm like, "Uh, no, I'm not touching that. So unless it's causing an issue, or the child has stated like we need I need someone to talk to don't call me because you're getting into someone's personal business that has not breached that barrier of causing an issue at school you just know about something and you're assuming it's going to be an issue or it can be something where they're setting you up to be a part of someone else's misfortunes that are going on in their home and it's not necessary so once you've established that And you let them know like, hey, I'm not here for any of that stuff. I'm only talking about the child and dealing with what's in front of us right now, not what's going on at home and God is here, but what's going on right here so that we can get you to where you're stable and you can continue on with the day and you can go home and deal with this on your own because it's not my place to be involved in your home life. Now, if we're talking about something that in the mandated reporting spectrum, then absolutely. But it's imperative on that person who reported to me to do that first. Now, I've had situations where I was the first reporter and a parent has come up to the school and threatened to fight me. And once they turned the corner and saw me, that changed. But those things happen. That comes with the territory. So it's kind of like understanding, like, again, I was in that mental health spectrum. So I knew it was either going to be involuntary committal or voluntary committal. Then we're going to do therapy and medication and all that after the fact. So it was always one, two, three, and occasionally this. So I already kind of knew going in there. So it was more so just dealing with what's in front of us right there. And after that, if it was something behavioral where it was a high function autistic student, that's a little bit different. More oftentimes than not, you're just putting a stimulus in front of them or finding out what the stimulus is, give it to them and placate them for the day. 
because you're not going to do anything therapeutic wise in conversation that's going to get us back down to a, a stable basis more so. Well, if the kid is acting up today because they want their laptop, give them the laptop and we'll go back to instruction later. <laughs> so if this child needs to be restrained, then that's something different. Most of the kids that I had to restrain, we already knew they were on a schedule. They were on a cycle. It's been a couple months and it's time for them to get riled up and agitated. And we already knew where we were going in that direction. So we already knew on this day, full moon, it's probably going to be a doozy today. <laughs> so, yo, so, so that's, a, that's, a, that's interesting. So I went to, uh, I was at a, uh, I was speaking to, uh, to some educators. That's what it was. I was speaking to some educators and she was saying that uh, today is going to be a tough day. I was like, why, why are you just like, why are you saying you like the day hasn't even started? We're doing. I'm talking about it's like an early morning um, PD, and um, she was like, Mercury's in retrograde, and I'm like, what? Mercury's in red? I, I didn't even know what that meant. And so it's like, it's kind of like when the moon is something, and then like behavior switch. I'm like, Lord, I, I, <laughs> I don't even know. I don't know what this is, but uh, but yeah, you said there are certain seasons, spring fever, uh, certain times of the year to where uh, kids just are ha have more issues and more challenges than others. In the in the mental health in the community mental health sector, those days are going to be full moon days, holidays, and because we live in the great state of Alabama and football is king, if Alabama's having a losing season, you're probably going to have some domestic issues. Um, if they're not in the national championship and college football is over with, sometimes it's some, I, I know this personally, I'm not being hyperbolic. You're going to have some issues after those games where, because I, I know personally, I had a lot of people that I dealt with who were big college football, mainly Alabama fans. So those type of things like major holidays, uh, any anniversaries that are significant to that client, you already know middle of uh, full moon days so on so yeah that that is very real that is very real and even with students like you know in particular with the the students who uh battle with autism they have a particular schedule and they don't get off of that schedule so you can almost bet your bottom dollar that first week of changing season because they're like especially when it gets cold we can't go outside as much so we're having to stay inside and that's and then you have the the change in temperature in the room also so we have heat coming in on us we're not being able to, we're not able to go outside and stay on our regular schedule i'm off a little bit <laughs> these things don't these things don't sit well with me so yeah that's amazing cuz there's, there's there's certain things that to somebody that um, I want to make sure I'm using the right language to somebody that doesn't have that that mental inclination, whether it be with autism or something else, uh, and that wouldn't cause maybe that much of a, a rift. But for somebody else that does, like that can that can be make it make or make or break. And so it made me think about this: uh, what are some of the things like in a, in a, a behavior set? And what are some of the things that you uh, experienced? Whether you, you already talked about autism. I'm pretty sure ADHD is probably a big one. Um, and I, I'm pretty sure there's a different way in which you handle that from a parent that is uh, with a student that is diagnosed and from a family that is undiagnosed, but it's also unrecognized. How do you deal? Think about this. You, you, you can look at them or you can, you know, the season, this kid probably has this, but they have the parents like in denial. How do you deal with those different things and those behaviors? Um, being in a role where you have, uh, and the parent is, you know, on those different spectrums as it relates to that. I, I It's funny you ask that question. I, I have a story that is verbatim what you're asking me. So I was called to a meeting by uh, a director and there was an issue with the child who had some very, very peculiar behaviors. Um, the parent was adamant that the child was being bullied. We pulled the cameras nobody's speaking to this child or saying anything. So I get there in the meeting and I'm literally watching this kid go and his eyes are like blinking very, very quickly. So I know what I'm looking at already because again, I have the mental health background and I, I, know, I know exactly what I'm looking at. So 
the parents in denial saying that it's being bullied. We've, we've done everything that we can. So the, the parent is requesting to move the child to a different school. They have every right to do that. Great. So I kind of just tapped the director and said, hey, can I ask some questions real quick? She said, sure. I said, um, how, how, how is his appetite? Well, he doesn't eat. He, he, if I give him something to eat, he doesn't eat anything. And this is a kid that's 11, a, a 10th grade, 11th grader. So his mom is speaking for him. He's not even speaking for himself. And if you ask him something, he's speaking in choppy sentences where he's not even formulating complete sentences. So yeah, this is 11th grade. And this just came out of the blue. This just started somewhere out of the blue. So I say, well, how does he sleep? He'll sleep. He's up all night walking up and down the hall. So that's pacing. He doesn't have an appetite. Um, he has this, he has an inability to formulate full sentences. He probably is not aware of the date and time. This is all psychosis. I know exactly what I'm looking at. So I go on to ask the question um, about medicines. Does he take anything? Um, does he have substance issues? Any of those, like the normal things you would ask. She says, no, um, he had some issues in the past, but he's not taking any medicine. And I don't like the, the agency that we have here because I had a bad experience with them, which is often the case with a lot of parents. They or aspirin for a headache, it's more so of, I need this type of medication to help with this situation. And maybe if I add a little bit, five milligrams, 10 milligrams of this, this combination will put me in a better state to think clearly. And it's not so much about it making me feel something different other than what I'm feeling, but it puts me in a stable position to where I can think rationally and deduce rationally. So the kid ended up moving to a school and I said it won't be a day or so before he's at alternative school. And he beat me by a week. He was moved to alternative school. So I got to see him directly. I saw him every day, had him right under the camera. And he's having a conversation pointing at the wall. Okay, so you're hearing voices. You're having the auditory hallucination. Again, I know what I'm seeing. And so finally, we got to a situation where this child had to be put on medication and all of this stuff that you have to do in, the, in an educational setting. But it took us getting to that situation because a parent was in denial and also because of the lack of true education about mental health. Like we talk about mental health a lot on the feeling side but we don't talk enough about how it works on a clinical setting and how what to expect so i was thankful for my position because i was able to be a liaison between those agencies and say hey you're going to be expected to do one two three and four you're going to need to do this you're going to need to do this you're going to see a nurse you're probably going to see a doctor who's going to be foreign who's not going to speak the language very well um he's going to be talking to you from a computer so don't get caught up in something like be just focus because it's a very if you're not initiated it's a very scary experience yeah and the thing one of the things that because we uh and now I, I get more into this uh we met because i was uh coming out to the district that you know and i actually was doing working with the counselors and social workers and we were having that conversation about mental health and from my purview man i i, I agree with you uh because you have people that are on different ends of the spectrum as it relates to mental health. Uh, you know, you have some people that are in denial, right? Said that this isn't a real thing. You know, you just got to get through it, you know, fight through it. Because what? I had a lot happen in my life. I had a, a, a challenging childhood situation. So you mean to tell me my kid experiences the same thing and now they got this? Uh, who's to say that you didn't have it? You know what I'm saying? But not, so it's like since my experience was one thing and, and I – um, view this as one way now it's like every way is this way you know and and I think that uh, we really have to have some real conversations about like what is mental health and really getting the uh, individuals that care about not only student mental health but the mental health of the adults that are in those buildings too absolutely and I and this might be far-fetched and maybe far left, but I am a firm believer that there's a difference between mental health and behavior. A huge difference between the two. You can have some behaviors that are negative, 
And yes, they may stem from some disturbance in your mental stability, but it is not the same as a mental health issue. Speaking from a clinical perspective, I have actually seen a true bipolar person in real life and in the flesh. I have seen an actual schizophrenic. I've seen an actual drug addict who's labeled as bipolar, but simply just having withdrawals. They're, they fall in line with someone who would be a bipolar because I'm asking, I'm crying, I'm begging for something and I switch immediately. But it's more so because I couldn't get what I wanted not so much from the, the the true bipolar person I met who was literally talking to me about going to see their family and having a good time, but in full blown tears. Because the emotions, the emotions with the actual feelings, they didn't connect and they were on two opposite ends. So I'm crying about something that I'm happy about, but I'm happy and I'm jovial about something that I should be torn up about. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I think, man, as you relate to that, because I think that's tough because I think that we have to really um, get to a place where we're having real conversations about this because I think one of the reasons why those behavior challenges are you know, being categorized as maybe mental health issues because there's, there's a lack of understanding, a lack of knowledge as it relates to those things. And so now we see a behavior, well, there's got to be mental, or we see this, and it's got to be... Like uh, one of the studies, and and I man, this is this is something that I resonate with because I was a kid that uh, active in class, uh, was very smart, and so I, I did my work. But the behavior thing, and I had a teacher that t- told me in class that I had ADHD. I remember telling my mom in that conversation. My mom, you know, she she, you know, she ain't like that too much, and so I won't get too I won't get too deep in that. But you can just imagine what that situation was like. Anyway, um, you know. But this uh, A score, and so there's a study with ACEs that, that shows that like individuals that have experienced trauma um, have uh, behaviors that res- that that present itself as the ADHD or ADD, uh, but they don't have it. Literally, when they experience something that reminds them of those traumas, those, those they react in ways that resemble much so somebody that has this. And what she noticed is that a lot of uh, uh, kids that were black and brown kids that were in these minority communities. They were all on ADHD, ADHD medicine, but the majority of them didn't have it. They needed, they were treating the symptom, but they weren't treating the root. They needed to be treated from the root, which is that they have to deal with those traumas. So then you have to ask yourself the question, what are we treating? Are we treating the, the functionality of an actual disorder? Or are we treating something that is not falling into conformity with what we want as an educational system we live in a society that promotes overindulgence and fast-paced get to it now the race is not given to the strong nor the swift but those who endure we quote those things but we want something different so if i have a kid that's sitting in my classroom that's not adhering to the practices that i recommend based on whatever curriculum or learning at the pace that everyone else is learning at obviously there's something wrong other than the fact that maybe we can slow down and give them a little bit more time and a little and be a little bit more patient because everyone doesn't learn and move at the same pace so then that creates a snowball effect that trickles down to we already have some of these children who are probably dealing with some of the most horrific things in their households but i hate to be that person but so do all of us (laughs) we deal with some traumas in, in certain things but Again, the topic of what we're discussing today goes back to all of that. Where's the resiliency at? We're not doing enough of that because we live in a society that does not want you to fail, does not reward failure, does not reward resiliency, and does not look at accountability in a fair practice. Because accountability goes more than just pointing out when you do something wrong, but it's holding people accountable when they do something right that continuously perpetuates them to want to do right. We don't do any of that anymore. At best, you might get a sticker or a star on a paper, but kids look at paper all day long. Another smiley face on a paper means nothing now. Like these archaic practices are outdated and they don't mean anything anymore. So I got a question for you. So how, so I'm real curious about this because in a school or or a district-wide setting, um, I'm interested to know how many individuals have the, 
um, educational background that you have. So understand really from a clinical standpoint some of these things. Uh, and so I would imagine not as many as there should be. And so because you are come from clinical, but now you're in the education setting. So how does one now navigate in an environment that's it's focused on the educational piece, has to deal with these things that are what psychological components, but they're doing it from an educational perspective versus the clinical perspective. And without that knowledge, now you have to kind of go throughout your day saying that it's this way, but based on the practices and the rigidity of those and how long those have been in place, now you have to kind of flow upstream, you know what I'm saying? I mean, swim upstream to kind of like get down to the root cause and be able to make change and, and make um, make headway on some of these things that really, really need to move forward on. So it's more so taking me out of the pond, moving me to the lake in terms of a fish. We work in a situation where I know clinical parameters, but my clinical parameters are not in accordance with what educational parameters are. So first we have to look at what board policy states. When we get into a lot of these things, when you're on a upper management type deal, let's look at board policy. What does our board policy say? If we don't have anything, we have an opportunity to create precedence. And we know what we can do within the law and what's required. But dealing with it on that, on that side is, first of all, let's understand what is worthy of calling someone and what is worthy of moving on from. We can have a child that may have an accident in the hall. And it, it's the same as like a toddler. If you have a baby and they fall and everybody stops and look at them and says, oh, they're going to cry. But if you look away and don't bother with it, they won't cry, but you always have an opportunity to go back and say, hey, now, what did you learn when you fail or what did you what happened? What did you experience? Because a lot of times things happen to us and we need a few minutes to process what's actually going on. So a kid may have an accident and you give them a moment to process. They're probably sitting in your classroom. They're not paying attention. They're processing what's going on. And then at the end of that class, you may have a moment say, hey, I noticed that you fell in the hall and I didn't want to draw any attention to you. Like it's ways that you can dress it up and deal with it and say, hey, let's talk about that. What did you feel at that moment? Because now I got an opportunity to relate back to you because we have something tangible to deal with other than just I feel everybody's looking at me. I got attention. Let me go to what I know was comfortable. But I've really had a time to process. So we'll talk about that and we kind of work through those things. And for the ones who have the true mental health issues, I'm asking about medications and so on and so forth. And it, it just goes back to delineating what is actually a mental health issue and what is not. Is it something that an administrator just doesn't want to deal with? Um, is it something that we that requires all hands on deck? Is it something that's necessary to stop and halt the whole day? More oftentimes than not, it's really not. But it's teaching us how to work with something. It's kind of like working outward to inward. When something happens, as an administrator, it's like, oh, God, I didn't want that to happen today, and that's going to mess my whole day up because I want to sit down and do reports and blah, blah, blah. It's a small little fragment of the day, and it's how you treat it. So how you approach it is the same way that the kid needs to learn how to approach it. It's something small. Process it. We're here for support. Let's move on because we have other work to do. And understanding the core. I think that's important because one of the things that, that I realized is something that you just mentioned, which I want to kind of dive a little bit deeper into, is that whole area of you said that, hey, it's something that happens. Give them some time. I have an opportunity to say, hey, what did you learn from that? And then show them empathy. So it's that, that when it comes to empathy, for me, there is this desire or there's a connection that kind of draws you in to be empathetic in those. Because there are some individuals that have gone through some things where they choose not to show empathy uh, across the board. So my question for you is, what was it like from your history? Uh, I know you, you're a resilient individual. And so you've had some different things within your life that kind of allows you to have the empathy that is required uh, to show different kids that are not your own kids, right? But what still, with them not being your biological children, you still have that desire and that urge to be able to show them empathy 
and it's what across the board in some very much so challenging situations, some of the most challenging situations that educators and administrators face throughout their day. So what was your history like that allowed you or to equip you to be able to do those things? To piggyback off of a, a very famous interview that's going on right now, I knew a lot until I got out in the real world and realized that I didn't know anything. And I grew up with this fallacy of thinking that once I became an adult, everything was going to be perfect because I was able to control everything because as a child, I couldn't control anything. So as an adult, I had this fallacy that I'm going to be the big man in charge. I'm going to do everything that I want to do. And the reality of it is that's not the case. So being someone who internalized nothing and dealt with and processed everything around me, but internalized nothing, I know as an adult now, because I'm learning how to process and deal with my feelings and actually talk about them. And if I was a kid who, who literally had a barrier up and couldn't, like, I literally saw my cousin's brains on the sidewalk. And I walked right past it like it was nothing because I knew I needed to go console my cousin or my aunt or someone else. Like none of these things ever hit me. It was like I processed it after the fact and I'm like, okay, well, it was more important for you to be supportive to somebody else than to deal with what's going on with you because you're going to be okay. So I grew up from that perspective. I seen a lot, experienced a lot and never truly internalize things and still don't i can see it it'll happen and my first thought is to go be helpful to somebody else who's dealing with it so it translates directly back to my the kids that i see because i'm like i know how i felt when that happened like i had a kid that um was being tried for attempted murder he wasn't the shooter but he was involved with some other kids who were and i can see that face, I can see that gazed off look. I've been there before. I know what's going on right now. Hey, come in my office for a second. Now we're gonna talk about, do you even understand when your lawyer says you're going to enter a uh, youthful offender plea? No, I don't know what that is. My mom just telling me and everybody else saying. I'm like, so how do you feel about that? What do you know? Well, I don't know. Well, come, come, come behind the computer. Let's look it up real quick. Let's look it up and see what that actually means. Let's talk about these things. Like, cause I, it's obviously bothering you. Like it was fun and games when you all were coming in C pod and D pod and all those things that went on in the jail, you thought that was funny and it's really not, but you found humor in that. You found humor in your pain, but now let's come be authentic because the clock's going to run out on that and it's only going to take you so far. So it's being, seeing those faces, seeing those things, experiencing it at a very young age, I'm all too familiar with it. And even as an adult, I can look at somebody and tell, today ain't a good day for you. I think that's, um, um, what I heard you say is that you chose to be what you wish you had. You know, like there are times where uh, you didn't have a space to be able to process and you had to always put other people in, you know, ahead of yourself. Well, let me clarify that. It was never that I didn't have it because I had wonderful parents. I just didn't know how to. I didn't have the ability. I didn't know how to use my words and say, hey, this is bothering me. It's not just as simple as saying this is bothering me. And I understand that all too well. Yeah. But even like that, that so, but still to a, to a certain degree, um, what, I, what I was sharing was that there was something inside of you that said that like, this is what I'm supposed to do. You know, I'm supposed to not focus on me in a situation like this. And I'm supposed to make sure that my cousin is good. I'm supposed to make sure that my aunt is good. Something, whatever it may be. And like I said, I had amazing parents too, but also I address a lot of situations from the standpoint. It's like, okay, I'm not important. You know what I'm saying? In this situation, I got to make sure that you're good. Uh, and, you know, I do uh, some disc assessments and stuff like that. And uh, one of the things that I realized is like that's kind of a part. Like I, I, I care about people. And so, but sometimes what I put people ahead of myself. And so there has to be some balance, especially with that, because now what happens when you need someone or when you need something, you can't always, you know, go, go down this journey of, 
you know, everybody, everybody, everybody else, and then you're left with nothing, you know? But I think even looking at that from a disparaged perspective of thinking who's going to help me, it's not about somebody helping you. It's more so of someone giving you the latitude of expression because being resilient is is a discipline that it, it's really an art form of taking the pieces of your life that life that has shattered has been shattered by life and using them to make some form of art or some form of expression from that and saying okay i've been broken i've been cracked but there's still some beauty in this work that i have to do and understanding that sometimes you just need someone to listen to you sometimes you just want somebody to say um well you got it you'll do whatever i'm finding out as I mature and move into different avenues, I don't want somebody that's going to tell me that I'm right. Cause I've never had that anyway. Like I've always had parents that I, if I was involved in something in school, I could be dead to rights, not involved in any shape, form or fashion. I did nothing wrong, but my parents are going to say, well, you were in the wrong because for some reason you got caught up in it. So you're in the wrong place at the wrong time. You might've not did anything wrong, but you still did something wrong. So in all situations in my life, I'm accepting my culpability and saying, okay, let me fix that. Let me write that shit. Now, my issues may be something small, but now let's get into yours because I know where I made the mistake. At. Do you feel like that's played a, a significant role in your resilience journey? Because I think from a, when I think about resilience, there is this level of responsibility and ownership, um, that, that's required in order for you to go from where you are, accept, accept where you're at, uh, but then also accept that there's something on the other side of this, or there's maybe something different ahead of this, or just maybe you haven't accepted anything except where you're at, and you just got to work through it. But there, do you feel like you're, you're, um, you taking that ownership and accountability and responsibility has played like a significant factor in like your resilience journey? Absolutely. I think 100% of the, it, well, not 100%, but the vast majority of the issues we deal with on a regular basis comes from not accepting responsibility and fighting to hell and high water to not accept responsibility. So if you get past that initially, hey, I was a kid when I first started working, I never wanted to be written up. I took pride in never being written up. I got written up one time and I was like, it bothered me for almost six months. I took the write up and tacked it on my wall. I was so annoyed by it. Like my supervisor would come in and see that same right of tact on my wall because I was that hell driven about being motivated and being disciplined. And I didn't want to lose that discipline. But now I'm much older, much mature, much wiser. I, I'll accept responsibility, whatever. Now let's move past it. What can we do to not make this happen again? It's not so much about trying to avoid it because it's going to happen. But I know through my prayers and through my studies, when you pray for growth and change, you have to go through some disruption because that's that it's the same as weightlifting and weight training in order for your muscles to grow you have to tear them down so in order to grow and be better you have to be willing to be torn ripped stretched bruised beaten whatever it calls for but i always have the optim the optim the optimisticness about it to say i'm going to be better as a result of this so the question i have with you and we're gonna we're gonna land this plane what do you where did this mindset come from? Because this is not just like like this is like this. Like, where did this come from? Like, how did you? What did you gain this perspective? The way that you're wired. Where did, where did that come from? It came from meeting pivotal people on my way to my journey to where I'm at now. Every significant situation I can tell to you about resiliency came into play. There was somebody that I met along that journey. And I may or may not even still be in contact with a lot of those people, but I never disclosed anything about myself to anybody that I was around. I've always been observant and listened to their story, and I learned through observation. So someone can be going through something in their life, and I'm talking with them, and it's something that's mirroring directly with me. And I already know from what they're saying, I'm not going to go that route. <laughs> but I kind of have some 
some idea of where I should go, where I'm dwelling in my ha- in my mind state right now, where I'm dwelling in my temple. So I'm like, okay, well, I can't go this way, not going to go this way. So let's kind of keep it steering the road and understand that what you need is going, it comes from internally. You can't go chase somebody and go find somebody to give you an answer for something. It's all internal. You just have to learn how to just deal with the struggle and the resistance, push through, and you'll get past it. And you will learn how to move from it going forward versus trying to learn in the midst of it. You're not going to learn very much when you're beaten, broken down. But when you recover, you have a moment to process and deal with certain things. You're a lot more thankful for them after the fact. But in short form, there have been very pivotal people that I've met on my way in my journey that have kind of been beacons or pillars in my life that reminded me of X, Y, and Z or what was going on at that point. Gotcha, gotcha. I think that you remind me, I'm the youngest of 11. And uh, and so my brother, older brothers and sisters um, obviously didn't do everything right in their life. And so uh, I come from a family that was uh, uh, a part of the belt ministry, you know? <laughs> so, so, you know, I saw the, the, the punishment that they received for, and so I was like, okay, that's not smart. I think, and I think that's probably one of the most amazing things that I learned that helped me is like, what did somebody else do and where did that get them? And we too often have to learn by experience. I promise you, I do not want to learn every lesson in my life from experience alone. I, I just, I, I just don't want to. And so it's something I don't have to experience. You don't have to. Right. And so, Man, this has been a, a, an amazing conversation. Man, I feel like I've, I've I've learned a lot. I have this thing, this segment out here that I call uh, that I end with every time. It's called um, "Better Days Ahead," and what that is is just for anybody that's listening. Um, do you have any words of wisdom? Any whether it's a quote, whether it's uh, just a mantra that you live by, uh, just to be able to encourage somebody, uh, you know, that, that's listening here. So. Uh, what encouragement, what words of wisdom do you have as we end this for uh, somebody that our better days are ahead? I go back to a chopped up version of Ecclesiastes 9 and 11. The race is not given to the strong, nor the swift, but he who endures. And if you can learn to endure, life is going to be great for you. When you learn to endure, you learn how to not take shortcuts not go after things that are not for you, understanding what is not for you and being okay with what is not for you because God has something for you later on down the line. And because one door closes, those double doors may open at the end of the hall. (laughs) The first door may have closed on you because you're down on the far end of the office, but those double doors are going to open for you at some point because people are having conversations and talking about you because you are staying vigilant and doing the work in rooms that you haven't been in yet. And so when you right thing to do. Doing right comes natural to people who are put together wholly. And Understanding and deal into if I'm talking to someone who's an educator, I would say there's a, a famous painting, I forgot what it's called, but it's the picture of God holding the lantern. I think it's called the light of the world, and it's a door that doesn't have a knob on the outside. And someone asked the artist, Why you you didn't finish your painting? There's no do- there's no knob on the door. And he said that the door to the human heart has no handle on the outside. You have to be let in from within. So as an educator, in order to reach these children, you have to work for them to unlock that door from the inside and allow you to come in. You're the beacon of light shining on the outside for them in a dwelling of darkness. But they have to make the decision to open that door to allow you in. And once you get in that door, don't get in the house and get the kicking stuff around and saying you need to organize this and do that. Just just politely sit and listen. And you will be told exactly what you need to do. Wow. Wow. I mean, that's that's the most amazing thing that we, that we can end on right there. 
uh, I just want to end with that, uh, what he said, uh, be that beacon of light, uh, be that beacon of hope, um, be that encouragement that there are better days ahead. And as we continue to shine that light um, on the world, I think that uh, more people will let us in and it allows us to be able to build that community that we are designed to not only live in, but also how we were designed to thrive. Uh, my man, Mr. Quarker, you sold me the gems. Uh, thank you so much for your time. I will appreciate you. Uh, another episode of the Mindset on Resistance podcast. We're out. Thank you.